Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation on the role of technology solutions in fighting the climate crisis as part of our DevEx at COP26 series of conversations. I'm Catherine Cheney. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx focused on technology and innovation and global development, and I'm really thrilled to be moderating this live panel. So just a bit of context before we dive in. To meet climate targets, countries need to quantify, monitor, and reduce their emissions. And of course, technology will be critical in each step of this process. And because repairing the damage that's already been done by climate change will require more than cutting emissions, there's growing interest in technologies like carbon removal and solar geoengineering. You've seen those topics come up on the COP26 agenda. But in addition to developing new technology, we also need to drive down the cost of existing low carbon technologies in order to deploy these technologies everywhere in the world, including in the low and middle income countries that are most impacted by climate change. So today we'll hear from three leaders who are tackling climate technology solutions from a number of angles. And I'll quickly introduce them before we dive into the conversation. You'll see them here. Ifioma Malo is CEO of Clean Technology Hub Nigeria, which is focused on promoting energy access through research, development, demonstration, and incubation of clean energy technologies. She's also the former country campaign director for Power for All in Nigeria. And she led Nigeria's campaign to promote distributed renewable energy and is one of the country's leading energy access experts. Zach Parasa is the co-founder and CEO of NCX. He's working on a carbon exchange built on reliable data. So the technology breakthrough here, as I understand it, and I'll let him expand on this, is combining satellite imagery with field measurements to determine the size and species of every acre of forest in the US. NCX helps American landowners get paid for the carbon they capture in standing trees. And I'm excited to talk with him about this model or work like it might be extended to low and middle income countries. And Olamide Ongutoye is tech policy lead for the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. He leads policy work at the Tony Blair Institute on energy and climate tech. And recently, Olamide has been active in discussions about sustainability in Africa, as well as the role of connectivity in combating climate change, something I definitely hope we can get to. So thank you all so much for joining us. Really looking forward to the conversation. So my first question is for you, Ify. Um, I know that Clean Technology Hub Nigeria is committed to supporting the next generation of Africa's clean energy leaders. And I really want to make sure in this conversation, we're focused on not just climate technology solutions in, in the broader sense, but climate technology solutions emerging from everywhere and extending to everywhere. So your mission is very relevant here. And, and my question for you as is uh, what do you see as the big challenges and opportunities to do just that, your mission, support the next generation of Africa's clean energy leaders? Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to all of the other panelists and organizers. Um, very happy to be here. So at Clean Tech Hub, we're one of the leading innovation and, and um, acceleration centers in West Africa. One of the things that we're seeing with our portfolio of companies is that we are able to get them to do demos of their technologies, their clean technologies, but it's, a, it's difficult to get them to scale. Part of that challenge is, is not just the financing part, but it's also the raw materials that they're using to fabricate um, these technologies in-house. And to get them to scale, they actually need to bring in raw materials through supply chain mechanisms from outside of the country. Now that's where issues then come in for them because they're now dealing with issues around you know, supply chain management, procurement, international procurement, customs, but these are very small companies. So what we need to do is to get people who can actually look at their technologies and then help invest in them locally and help them to think about how to um, get them to market, to scale. Because a lot of the technologies that are developed in Nigeria, at least the ones that we've seen, um, actually with a bit more push, can actually begin to produce at scale. We see that being done in, in locally fabricated clean cook stoves, um, which are then sometimes cheaper and easier to maintain than what we would ordinarily get if they were imported. So the three things that I, I would say are the challenge are um, a belief in the entrepreneur's demo, um, looking at sourcing local materials to help them to scale, and local materials that can help them actually make the 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 the, the, the technologies that they have brought out a bit more steadier and stronger, and also beginning to put in um, a lot of local financing so that they are not stuck in trying to raise external financing at such a small stage because they're still very young companies 
um, to be able to help them be distributed um, locally in the local markets. So those are the three things I, I would say that we have to begin to really think about to look at local technology scaling locally in the communities that they're produced. Thank you, Ify. And I know you're working to tackle those challenges, but also there's, I assume, an opportunity for the global development community to do even more. I know there's been a big focus on local financing for climate tech entrepreneurs, but it sounds like it's not really moving the needle yet to the extent it needs to um, where you're working. So thank you for that preview of your work. Uh, I want to bring Zach into this conversation. So Zach, um, I know you're joining us from Glasgow. <laughs> so sure. thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're very busy. I'm seeing your name pop up all over the COP26 agenda, um, especially events focused on exactly this climate, uh, climate technology solutions. So uh, I, I mentioned earlier a little bit about how NCX works, but I wonder if you can kind of uh, expand on the technology itself and how it helps landowners quantify the full value of their forests. And uh, I want to add that I know you're focused on the U.S., but um, part of why I wanted to include you in this conversation is I wonder if you can talk about how your model or a similar approach might work globally, including in low and middle income countries. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Catherine, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to great to be with all the, all the panelists here. So. Um, yeah, so just like you said, we measure, we use satellite imagery and ground measurements to measure every acre or every hectare of forest every year down to the number of trees by size and species. And that's really important uh, because in, in order to create markets that can pay landowners to create more forests, uh, to create more carbon dense forests, and, and to, uh, that, that's respectful of things like biodiversity, water and fire risk, we need robust measurements uh, with like these markets are fundamentally different than what we, you know, what we've seen before with extractive markets like timber. With those markets, there's a scale at the mill and there's a physical good that rolls off the property and that people take delivery of. With these, uh, you know, with carbon, with biodiversity, uh, these benefits are happening out in the woods. And so to earn trust, to have trust with, uh, you know, with these communities, with these landowners uh, that, you know, they're getting paid fairly for the work that they're doing to create these benefits that we all need uh, and to make sure that the, you know, the communities, countries and companies that are paying for, you know, for these positive outcomes have transparency in what is actually being done on the ground. We need robust measurements. And so really the measurements make the market. Um, and that's that's been our approach. You ask about expanding to other countries. That's, you know, What's different today than where I think we were, you know, even a decade ago, five years ago, is that we do have the tools with, you know, uh, for monitoring. We have a lot more satellite sensors up. We have, a, you know, uh, we have a lot more computational ability. Um, and, you know, while there's that, you know, there's that part, we also have a much more uh, sort of community engagement and, and I think political will to really expand this further. So our intent is to expand uh, market access, truly democratize access to these markets globally uh, to the people and places that are at greatest risk. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to follow your journey as you look at uh, the global uh, potential for your model. Um, I actually learned about your work in a conversation on climate tech solutions where uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce mentioned NCX as an exciting company to watch in this space. So um, that put you on my radar and I'm really looking forward to following what you do next. Um, a question for Olamide and part of why I'm so excited to have your perspective is I think you can kind of uh, give us what you see as the landscape of technological solutions here. So I wonder, you know, we've heard from Ify about her work with energy access entrepreneurs in Nigeria. We've heard from uh, Zach about his work on a really exciting um, technology solution here in the U.S. And, and potential for global expansion there. So what do you see as some of the most exciting technological solutions for climate change across all the areas I mentioned earlier? Um, what's, what's exciting? Um, what's potentially game changing? And critically, what role do policymakers have to play in order to ensure that these tech solutions realize their potential? All right, thanks very much, Catherine. And it's great to be here. Um, nice to see you, um, Zach and Ify. Um, in terms of what's exciting, there is a lot um, to be excited about. Um, climate tech um, is in that phase where virtually everybody and anyone has um, a, an opinion about it. And an event like COP26 is even driving up for their media engagement. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things out there. Um, it can be a bit challenging, though, because then it also creates a bit of distraction, um, and which then gives policymakers an issue cutting through the noise and figuring out what's really um, the things to focus on. Um, 
But everything from the technologies we use to replace the old incandescent bulbs to the technologies we use to heat up our homes to, you know, direct air capture and things like that. There's a whole range of um, developments happening across the climate tech landscape. Um, and many of them are quite exciting. Um, the ones that I'm particularly interested in, and I you kind know, of just generally find um, um, exciting, are those ones that are clearly on a learning curve. And what that means is simply technologies whose price gets to decrease with increasing ins installation. And we've seen that with quite a number of technologies like solar, for example, in 2009, just about you know 10 years ago, the price of solar was that. You know, just 10 years later, it's this. It's gone down by about 90 percent. If you look at onshore wind, for example, the price has gone down about 75 percent in just 10 years. Um, and the same kind of learning curve evolution is happening across board in areas like batteries and in some other interesting areas of climate tech. So for me, that's quite exciting, um, even though there's so much noise out there and you have to be able to kind of distinguish between what's the noise and what's really happening, what's the, what's the real change. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for optimism here. And one of the things we have done, and I've, I've led um, some of the projects so far at the Tony Blair Institute, is to look at the landscape and to kind of categorize these technologies into three big buckets. So the ones that are already here and now and are already mature, um, the ones that are a bit on the other extreme end, which needs a bit more R&D support, and everything in between, which needs to be scaled up um, and ramped up in terms of um, deployment. So those are the technologies that are out there, and I'm quite excited about them. I mean, in terms of what policymakers can do, um, also along the lines of those three buckets, um, we have things around standardizing some sorts of technologies. So, for example, the energy efficiency technologies for our homes, you know, um, and on the other extreme end, where you have R and D supports, um, it's important for policymakers to start kind of looking at what are the bottlenecks. For example, around experimentation and demonstration, uh, which can be supported with um, public uh, finance. Um, and then everything in between, which requires a bit of public-private um, partnerships and um, supporting um, entrepreneurs and startups to make sure that these technology solutions can be deployed at scale to the market. Thank you. I love that framing of the three buckets. And I want to remain on that point for a moment because I think it's a good way to have a conversation, the four of us. Um, but I also see some questions coming up in the Zoom, which we really welcome. That's the benefit of, of a, a live panel here. So please keep those questions coming and I'll try to get to as many as I can. But keeping on this point from Olamide, so these um, three buckets, technologies that are available and mature, but need to standardize, emerging tech that needs R&D support, and then everything in between, tech that needs to be ramped up by engaging with innovators and entrepreneurs, which I would say is particularly challenging often in low middle income country context. So I wonder, um, oh, it looks like we may have let, lost Ify. Hopefully she will be coming back shortly. Um, but Zach, a, a question for you here. Where do you see yourself fitting in um, in these three buckets? And, um, and w do you think that that's a, a helpful framework? Do you look at the ecosystem of, of climate tech solutions similarly, or would you maybe reframe? No, I think uh, Alameda's framing is actually great. Uh, you know, forests and, and nature, other nature-based solutions are one of the first best options that we have for sort of uh, emission reduction. And so it was really great seeing uh, commitments to to reduce, you know, and, and eliminate deforestation um, and and carbon removal. Uh, and they're, they're sort of the here and now. Uh, there have been technical hurdles um, that, you know, that have been largely worked through, but and there is still need for standardization and clarification of quality in in that work. So there's there's more to do there, but it's really going to take everything to to bend the arc on on climate change. And so it's really encouraging seeing a lot of the work coming out of so many places, especially beyond Silicon Valley, in in the places um, you know as as if he was mentioning where capacity building uh, is is so vitally important. And and as you know. As we work with forests they're, and, and nature-based solutions, they're not an infinite sponge. And so we need that cost curve to be coming down on those, on those technologies that Alimita was talking about that are, that are further out. And, and really by working you know, both fronts and, and really investing ourselves and, and working kind of collectively as a community to drive these things forward, that's how we're going to get to real solutions, not picking one and saying, this is the answer or that is. It's really, it's a, it's really a yes and situation. But you know, to, to the point, the important thing here is that Forests are one of the, yeah, they are a, and, and nature-based solutions overall, I should, should be more inclusive there, but um, they're what we can immediately work with today as we, as we make the investments necessary in, in communities and technology 
to, you know, to be there, you know, further out with, uh, with the tech we need to fully remove carbon from the atmosphere and decarbonize our economy overall. Thanks, Zach. I'm going to ask you a question that came in from the audience. Um, and I'll just relay it directly. The question is, is remote sensing and satellite technology used to verify landowner reports? It is. Yeah. So satellite imagery and, and computational technology that allows us to assess that and derive like meaningful and actionable information from that data is what enables us, you know, broadly to, uh, you know, to drive down transaction costs and to, you know, to ensure trust through that transaction, whether you're working in the United States, Brazil, Indonesia, Guatemala, wherever it is. Uh, and, and the exciting thing is that that's globally available. Those, those data are globally available. We also use ground measurements to make sure that those assessments are well calibrated. Uh, and, you know, and there's, there's the opportunity, you know, with that for, for further community in, engagement. And so that's, um, so, yeah. Thanks, Zach. Really helpful. So I want to talk about um, climate tech solutions and how they fared in the COP26 agenda specifically. Um, so I guess I'll start with Zach here. Um, Zach, I know you've, you know, again, you're, you're there in Glasgow. You've been involved in a number of conversations on, on climate tech. So thank you for making time for this one. Um, but how would you say climate technology fared in the COP26 agenda? And can you kind of take us inside some of the conversations you've been having on this topic? I think it's been there's been a lot of excitement um, and sort of engagement around the investments in in technology. I you know seeing the private sector really step up um, and commit uh, large sums to to developing these technologies, not just with nature based solutions. Although again, there was a lot of emphasis on that, not only you know carbon and nature based solutions, but the the communities and biodiversity related to those. And that was really that was really great. But to Olmide's point earlier that you know that that the full suite of technology is going to require investment and at least we're we're seeing commitments that that look like they're that that's going to be made and it's going to be made globally and that you know that's uh like when you when, when you started out it's, it truly is going to take all of us and every you know yeah so i, I i'd be interested in hearing from olamide on on sort of his his thoughts on on how the commitments shaped up and and if they meet his yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and quickly, yeah. I'll say, Olamide, I'd, I'd be interested in both your reflections on how climate tech has fared at COP26 and and um, if if you were to somehow um, pull out a magic wand and turn COP26 into a win for climate tech, what would that look like? All right. Oh, I need a, a win now. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, I think so far it's been, I would say it's been a mixed bag, um, but perhaps a bit slightly more on the positive side of things. Um, so it's been good to see um, some of this uh, private sector commitments and also some you know, public-private partnership types of commitments. Um, so for example, the um, Glasgow Breakthroughs, which has been led by the British government and has the collaboration with um, quite a number of big countries, including you know, China, um, the US um, and Australia, and where they're looking at developing certain suits of um, um, green technologies, including um, green electricity, and I think it also includes um, a bit of um, green or sustainable aviation fuel, and, and, and it, quite a number of um, interesting technologies. Um, so that's that's very encouraging to see. Um, of course, on the other hand, you have you know people like Jeff Bezos joining um, two billion dollars um, into nature conservation, uh, which is also quite encouraging. And you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you have quite a number of such commitments. Um, some of them have massive um, supports co covering, you know, multiple countries. Um, some of them are kind of led by just a few um, group of countries or individuals. Um, but on the other end, um, you also see a lot of, you know, the routine finger pointing between countries, um, countries calling out each other and saying, you know, you're not doing enough. You know, so those things have a way of distracting from the real agenda. Um, we are at a time where. You know, every second draws us closer to 2050 targets, 2035 targets, 2030 targets. The last thing you want to do is to waste another year of COP. Matter of fact, there was no COP last year. It was deferred to this year. So we lost like, you know, two, two full years. So that's the last thing you want to do. You want urgent action. And anything else that will distract from, you know, putting our money into climate tech um, should be limited and avoided. But unfortunately, we've seen a bit of that. Um, but overall, I would say, you know, it's been a bit more on the positive side of things. 
Thank you, Olamide. And and Ify, good to see you again. Um, I know I know you uh, were bumped off. Sorry about that. Um, just to try and bring you into this question, um, and not intending to put you on the spot, but I was just asking Zach and Olamide. Basically, how has climate um, technology specifically fared on the COP26 agenda? Um, and I wonder, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that while you're based in Nigeria, you're actually in East Africa right now for some meetings that are related to the ongoing conversations in Glasgow, which I thought was really interesting. So I wonder, Zach kind of um, pulled back the curtain on some of his conversations in Glasgow. Can you take us into what are some of the conversations in East Africa right now, what are the conversations among people like yourself who are supporting this climate tech entrepreneurial ecosystem? Do you think that um, climate tech is on the agenda in the way it should be at COP26 or how would you reframe the conversation? That's actually a very good question. So I'm in Kenya um, as part of the Mini Grid Developers Association, the African Mini Grid Developers Association. And this is a, a, a group of developers that are driving mini and micro grids. Um, for rural and peri-urban communities. Um, one of the big conversations that we're having here is around data and the lack of it, actually. And to the extent that there is even any data, um, the lack of synchronization in the data, um, the lack of um, certainty in the data. Um, and yet, I mean, this is a problem in, in sub-Saharan Africa to, that is a, is a barrier for mini-grid scaling. Um, and yet there are tools to address that. There, there's obviously a lot of technology tools to address issues around data. Um, there are quite a few companies, about three or four big known ones um, on the continent that are trying to address issues around data using IoT, Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence to do that. Now, when it comes to COP, I think there's an assumption that we see uh, from those of us in the global south um, that there is, when it comes to the technology, that it's almost like a settled topic. Um, because, you know, it's easily available in the West. And so the, the, the way that the conversations are framed is, well, how are we going to scale it? What can we do with the data that is already available? Um, and how do we help the companies that are, are harnessing this data to use it more effectively? It's a different conversation here. The conversation we're having here is there isn't enough data. Um, we're not being able to extract the data um, using a lot of the remote monitoring systems that are easily available, like I said, elsewhere. Um, and when we do that, you know, there's a lot of issues around how we can deploy it. Um, also because there's a lot of mistrust between national governments from this side and the, the technology providers who, who are mostly um, foreign investors. Um, and so the question then is, you know, governments are then suspicious also about how this data is going to be utilized. So those are, it's from a policy level, there's that conversation and tension happening between governments and technology providers. And, and from a technical level, there is also that assumption that, you know, because um, issues around hardware and software um, when it comes to technology are settled, almost settled issues um, in the West, that they are the same here in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that's not the case. So a lot of the developers here are still struggling um, to understand even, you know, when they want to do site selections, um, how they go about that. Do they have to travel and use um, remote, um, um, take the risks of going into remote villages that they don't really know very well um, to go collect that data? Uh, but, but we do know that there are other ways of doing that. And, and so that's that disconnect that's happening. And we see it very evidently at COP, mm -hmm. um, where there's this conversation up here, and then we're having all these other conversations down here. So at some point, we okay. have to begin to each other. Thank totally you. agreed. Thank you. No, that's why I'm so grateful for this virtual platform so that we can all come together from Glasgow and from Kenya and um, really appreciate your perspective there. Uh, we just have a few minutes remaining, but I did want to go back to Olamide on something because I sort of previewed this earlier and I think it builds on what Ify was just mentioning uh, in terms of connectivity being a challenge as well. So um, Olamide, I know you focused on connectivity and um, energy access, and I wonder if you can uh, help us better understand why that's such a barrier when it comes to scaling up uh, clean technology solutions really globally. Right, absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, in terms of connectivity, the main thing is the fact that it's a very key enabler, um, as um, if you rightly mentioned. It's it's how you get your men in the field. It's how you get the mini grids up and running in the remote parts of southwestern Malawi, somewhere in the backside of the mountain. It's how you, you know, do your maintenance checks. It's how you 
get some of these clean technologies um, deployed at scale and up and running um, at the most efficient level. So it's extremely important. And what we have at the moment um, in this in, in Africa and in, in some other parts of the world is um, an internet penetration level that is still not where it should be yet. It's um, a mobile penetration level that is still not at the level where it should be yet. Um, and that's why it says a big barrier to the scale up of um, some of these technologies. The gaps are gradually being closed. Um, we can see some of the numbers around connectivity um, being increased. Um, if you look at different generations of connectivity technologies, so for example, you know the old school GPRS, SUG type of connection, the number of years it took to get to a certain population, like a 1 billion population, is far longer than how long it took 3G to get to 1 billion, which is far longer than how long it took 4G. And there are predictions that 5G is going to happen even much faster. And that's because each new generation can leverage the existing connectivity um, infrastructure um, to get to more people. So um, with a bit of, of, of optimism, we can hope that connectivity issues will be getting more and more um, um, better addressed and the gaps will be closed. Um, but it still plays a very fundamental role to the scaling up and the enablement of um, clean technology deployment in Africa. Absolutely. And when you mentioned the public-private partnerships that will be needed earlier, especially in that middle ground of, of those three buckets, the sort of everything in between, public-private partnerships to advance connectivity will be critical. Um, so seeing a lot of activity in this space, but there needs to be more. Um, so with just a, a few minutes left here, I want to go back to each of you. And in, in about a minute, if you can, can you expand on, you know, we, we mentioned at the outset, we need to incentivize breakthrough climate technologies but we also need to democratize those innovations that already exist. So my question for each of you, if you have a call to action coming out of COP26, what's one thing you want to leave our audience with when it comes to either of those things, how to incentivize breakthrough climate technologies or how to democratize those innovations that already exist? And if time allows, you can tackle both if you'd like. Um, I'll start with Zach, if that's all right. Sure. Yeah. So uh, really excellent points uh, from, from Ify and Lamide there. I, in terms not just that these tech and like some of the tech isn't fully available to to all communities and there's a lot that needs to be done to close that gap but also that those technology solutions often aren't just drop-in solutions that we really need to take social context into account if we're going to bring you know bring these opportunities to you know to every community and truly be able to scale the solutions as quickly as we need to um and and to the point that we need to and so yeah when it when it comes to you know a call to action, what what can you know what can folks do, you know get involved in in capacity building uh, in whatever community you are in, uh, and and work to empower those that are you know working in adjacent communities or communities that are connected to the supply chains that that you are involved in. Um, you know if if you have the opportunity to invest in in these uh, in these technologies, recognizing that many of them are nascent and and uh, have a lot of development to to go do that. Uh, but overall, just get involved in the in the conversation, and find find opportunities to uh, to either it, like, you know, be fully engaged in the, in the innovation yourself or support those that are. Great. Thank you, Zach. Ify, we'd love to hear your perspective on this. What's your call to action? I completely agree with Zach. I, I think um, mentoring and educating um, the growing uh, technology entrepreneurs here, especially the renewable energy entrepreneurs are very important. But even more important is to look at what has happened in Nigeria in the banking sector. A lot of the back end support for our banking sector has been has been done by local developers in Nigeria. We need to begin to look at how this local tech can meet local renewable energy needs, um, just so that we're not waiting and waiting for when, you know, uh, there's going to be technology that comes from outside the country to come support the ecosystem here. So, and that had, that grew organically because there was a lot of focus in building the capacity, the human capital that could help drive the banking sector. We have banks in rural areas in one of some of the most rural areas across Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. How can we do that for the renewable energy sector? That's the big question. Thank you, Ify. Olamide, we'll give you the last word. All right, um, I completely agree with um, Zach and Ify. I think for me, on top of all that, it's also to um, get a bit more aggressive with the conversations at an event like COP26. And I think it's high time to have a sort of Paris agreement for climate innovation. Um, we need that level of ambition. Um, you know, COP 
in the in the past years have delivered some level of uh, milestones in the past. So in 2009, we had the COP in Copenhagen that delivered the $100 billion climate finance um, agreement. In 2015, we had the Paris Agreement that delivered the you know, two degrees and 1.5 degrees um, commitment. I think it's high time to have another sort of massive global aggressive agreement around climate tech and innovation. And I think that's the call to action. Thank you. If we had more time, my follow up question for all of you would be, OK, what would this Paris Agreement for climate tech innovation look like? But uh, we'll have to hold that conversation for another time. I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to share your insights on this topic. Thanks for the work you're doing in this space and uh, hope to see a lot more progress on all the work you're doing in climate tech innovation more broadly in the next year. We really need it. So thank you all so much again. Yeah, thank you. All. All right. Thank you. Thank you.